thanks for, for having me back over across town. Um, thanks, Dr. Das. That's a great lead into this talk. And I think it kind of summarizes nicely the, the data that this is something people have really struggled with. And a lot of our colleagues actually still kind of think back of what they learned in medical school. So to some of them, it's a big, big surprise um, that, that some of these patients are doing better or when people rotate through clinic and they see a patient and they read the history and they say, my God, this person's been alive for years. How is that possible? It always was, but I think any of us who do this are seeing it more frequently than we used to. And a lot of these concerns about long-term toxicity, consequences of initial treatment, and functioning quality of life are becoming really relevant. <clears throat> These are my disclosures. There is almost nothing that's actually on label for leptomeningeal disease. So everything I'm talking about is basically off label or experimental. And I don't believe I have any relevant disclosures. Um, I think the other important distinction when we talk about brain mats versus leptomeningeal mats is it's often kind of a little hand wave, hand wave, I'm going to shove you in this category kind of thing. Um, people can obviously have both true parenchymal metastases as well as leptomeningeal metastases, the one can lead to the other. I think the case that Dr. Das showed is a great example that it can be difficult to differentiate the two because lesions that arise from within the subcortical surface can then spread outwards. Um, and also we've really learned, and I'm gonna show something later from Dr. Bohr's work, that, that leptomeningeal disease can kind of track up the Rochelle robin spaces and then really end up looking like it's within the parenchyma, but that may not be what its molecular uh, pathologic origin was. So leptomeningeal metastases occur in about 5 to 10% of patients. That number at autopsy is definitely higher going back years and years of studies. There are certain sub-diseases in which it's uh, much more common, um, and the incidence of leptomeningeal metastases as well as brain metastases may well be increasing as we improve systemic disease. Uh, control and people are living longer. The, historically, it has an extremely poor prognosis. So I think this is something we still kind of struggle with with our colleagues and with patients. Um, and I think more important than their prognosis, when people have leptomeningeal metastases, maybe even a little more than, than brain metastases, their burden of symptoms and their functioning quality of life is really, really often quite affected because they're getting multifocal cranial nerve symptoms and multifocal spine symptoms. Um, so people really really struggle substantially with symptom burden with leptomeningeal disease, which isn't always the case when people have solitary brain metastases that are amenable to surgical control. Um, they're also not as amenable. You're talking about large volumes. So if you're going to use radiation, you're talking about giving a much larger volume of radiation burden, uh, which can be quite effective in this disease, but then you're talking about more neuropsychological consequences and fatigue in the short term and the long term. So I think that's why it's something we kind of all dread diagnosing and hearing that a patient has. Um, however, if you look at these pictures, there's kind of more and more media news. So Valerie Harper lived for many years with leptomeningeal metastases. Um, and I think it's something that patients can now find and say, oh, this is not some super rare thing. This is something people have been on talk shows and talked about. And for much of those years, she looked quite well. Jimmy Carter uh, with melanoma brain metastases, literally building Habitat for Humanity houses, working with drills and saws, um, and still obviously quite cognitively and physically fit for quite some years with, with leptomeningeal brain metastases for melanoma. So they're definitely prominent and obvious success stories. I think we also, as with brain metastases, we can give a much more accurate prognosis when we think about subtypes rather than lumping all leptomeningeal mets into one category. Um, we have some improvements in diagnosis that I'd love to talk about, um, maybe improving risk stratification for prevention. Uh, I put a question mark there, but I hope that that door is opening. And I think we're definitely expanding treatment options. We're actually getting formal trials of agents specifically for leptomeningeal metastases, which is, is quite remarkable. Uh, and then people like Mike Lance have organized cooperative study groups to really put together larger data sets because this is an uncommon disease. I really, really like this paper, and if you're interested, I recommend you look it up. So Dr. Bohr, Adrian Bohr from New York, had a paper in Cell in 2017, um, looking at animal models and some translational work of, of leptomeningeal metastases. And basically what she found through some really lovely detailed work is that uh, cancer cells produce complement C3, and that C3 expression on the systemic primary tumor was very powerfully predictive of later leptomeningeal metastases. Um, she developed an animal model uh, of leptomeningeal metastases 
disease where they can turn off and on systemic tumor C3 expression um, and blocking C3 completely prevented those animals from developing leptomeningeal metastases even when they had direct intraventricular uh, implanting of the tumor cells. Um, and she showed that complement C3 interacts with choriplexus C3 alpha receptor and that when the cancer cell C3 interacts with the normal choriplexus C3 alpha receptor, it opens the blood CSF barrier that's extremely specialized with the choroid plexus, and that that allows mitogens, especially amphiregulin, but numerous others to track out of the plasma and into the CSF. And once those, those growth factors were in the CSF together with the tumor cells, the tumor cells just take off. So there's a physical relationship that allows transmigration of cancer cells into the CSF, and it also allows growth factors that then spur the growth of those tumor cells once they've gotten access to that space. And she showed us also some lovely work that once that begins, you can follow this temporal migration of the cells through the CSF and then up into the virtual robin spaces where they then invade into CNS parenchyma. Um, and blocking any one part of this process did slow down or completely prevent the initiation growth or spread of leptomangial metastases. So this was some really exciting work, uh, possibly pointing at a, a single molecular pathway. Um, and they also showed in, in humans that you can find elevated levels of these markers in CSF samples from people with metastases and that they seem to track with disease activity. Um, other risk factors in solid tumors, melanoma certainly has a high incidence, HER2 positive breast certainly does, EGFR and outbute non small cell lung cancer. In small cell lung cancer, the incidence of brain and leptomeningeal metastases is so high that prophylactic cold brain radiation is recommended and fairly effective, at least in the short term. Um, BRAF mutant colorectal is kind of questionable, and I was interested that Dr. Das showed a, a case of HER2-positive GI cancers. But some of these are, are subtypes of systemic cancers that we usually think of as being low risk for brain meds. But now that they've been described and recognized, we seem to see them more often. So one of the other things that, that I think is a little bit of a mixed thing to put here, but that I find really useful, is in CNS lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there's a very, very well uh, established uh, and validated two data sets showing the risk uh, in, in diffuse uh, large B cell lymphoma, the risk of brain mets. This, this study's kind of lumped together brain and leptomeningeal metastases, but I think we can be a lot more nuanced about which lymphoma patients are at high risk and which are not. Um, risk factors, some of them being traditional ones like renal, adrenal involvement, age greater than 60, high LDH, uh, stage three or four metastatic disease, uh, but then also patients who have double hit, uh, patients with MYC and BCL2 expression have at least double the risk of later CNS or leptomeningeal metastases. So we can kind of use this data hopefully to guide us in thinking about who we could maybe actually be in a preventative role um, and get ahead of this disease and prevent it from spreading before that begins. We often kind of gloss over when we talk about leptomeningeal metastases that primary brain tumors can also have leptomeningeal spread and it is just as bad of a problem in the primary gliomas. Um, ocular vitreo retinal lymphoma, uh, 20 to 40% within the two to five year range are probably higher in the long term and many of those are leptomeningeal. Primary CNS lymphomas, it's definitely about 10% at initial disease diagnosis and it becomes higher. Malignant gliomas, people have started describing a higher incidence than we once thought, even at initial diagnosis. CNS peanuts, it's slightly controversial. It's a rarer disease, but they do seem to have a higher incidence of leptomeningeal spread. And then I think people have well accepted that the H3 mutant midline gliomas have a very high risk of multifocal disease, and quite a bit of that is leptomeningeal spread, and it can occur quite early on. Medulloblastomas, ependymomas, uh, and hemangiopericytomas, I think, are well recognized to have a higher incidence of this. And people are starting to look at some of these high-risk primary and brain tumors and ask whether, rather than giving the traditional local radiation, whether some of these people should get larger field radiation uh, at the beginning of their disease course, and with certain radiation modalities, it's become more feasible and better tolerated. So we should always remember the primary tumors. And this is an example of a patient of mine who on the left, upper left, presented with a lumbar complex cystic mass that proved to be an H3 mutant midline glioma of the spine. He had no other disease or any other disease site in his initial diagnosis. He did radiation and tenozolomide, and 16 months later, he developed truly, really diffuse and very symptomatic leptomeningeal disease throughout his cranium and the upper spinal column. Um, so there certainly is spread of this disease further on.
in prophylaxis, uh, things to consider is using CNS. I mean, one of the things that really kind of drives me crazy is that even though uh, CNS spread of lymphoma is incredibly common and very well recognized and has been a problem for decades, we still really don't have a definitive answer for what is the best way to prevent it. Uh, the traditional approach is to give intrathecal methotrexate. Uh, people have done studies back and forth, including some people in this room, about giving triple therapy with methotrexate and cytarabine um, or doing them as monotherapies. But we still don't have a satisfying answer about what is the best treatment to give to prevent the people that we know are at high risk, even though this is a common problem. There is some data from Europe that's retrospective suggesting that high-dose systemic IV methotrexate might be better at preventing CNS and leptomeningeal relapse in high-risk lymphoma patients uh, compared to intrathecal, but that remains to be confirmed. Uh, it would require a lot of cooperation for people to pool these, but now that we have better prognostic to know who's at risk, you could really do this in an intelligent and logical way and risk stratify people. Um, for CNS, PNETs, and H3 mutant gliomas, because they have such a high incidence in the short and the longer term, I think it's a relevant question about whether they should actually get craniospinal or larger volume radiation from the beginning, as we often do with medulloblastomas. Um, in non-small cell lung cancer, people did recognize the high risk of brain leptomeningeal metastases, and there was a randomized controlled trial looking at whole brain radiation as we use it in small cell lung cancer, uh, which failed uh, largely because patients did definitely suffer neurocognitive consequences and did not outweigh the benefit of the slight preventive effect. Um, and then there's some other kind of unusual subtypes of disease. Sinus lymphoma used to be a huge risk factor for leptomeningeal and CNS metastases uh, in the CHOP era. But once our CHOP came out, that really just seemed to disappear. And it's not something we saw in other high-risk types of lymphoma. So there may be very specific subtypes of lymphoma that respond to different approaches. And then I won't labor, but Dr. Das has talked extensively about the use of neoadjuvant SRS, which really might help us prevent another substantial portion of patients that are at risk. So we may have an opportunity in certain risk diseases to get ahead of the game and really decrease and prevent leptomeningeal disease before it begins, which would be much better than trying to catch up later. Uh, there have been some interesting advances in diagnosis of leptomeningeal disease. Obviously, any patient who has known cancer, especially those with high-risk diseases who presents with cranial nerve or ricotta equina palsies, especially multiple ones. Hydrocephalus without obstruction is another one um, that should really prompt a suspicion for leptomeningeal disease. One thing that I think fools some people is when people have mono or, or kind of minimal uh, cranial neuropathies and you get an MRI and it's negative and you do a lumbar puncture and it's negative, you should always remember that, that uh, intercurrent bony disease in the skull base can be quite occult on MRI and very small lesions can catch the nerves. So sometimes if you really are worried that someone has lepto based on their neurologic symptoms or a focal neuropathy, you want to remember that you want to look at the bone very, very carefully. So sometimes thin slice bone with or without PET can really help you determine that someone does not have lepto. In fact, they have a more peripheral cytoblockade of their disease. CSF cytology, unfortunately, is still the quote-unquote gold standard, but it's definitely not gold. Um, it's probably more like bronze. It's about 40 to 90 percent at detecting CSF cells, but when you do find them there, at least you can be fairly confident of your diagnosis. If an initial sample is suspicious, hypercellular, high protein, low glucose, and you really have a clinical suspicion, it's definitely worth repeating. Multiple studies have shown that second or even third large volume taps. And sample handling is really key. You can't just have these samples get plunked at room temperature and sloshed around and sit overnight. You really want to talk to your cytopathologist and deliver them the sample quickly under good conditions because the cells are quite friable. Um, and I mean, we did this when I was at Sloan Kettering. We had samples from a patient, and one sample we let sit overnight and kind of jostled it around a little bit. And the other sample we put right on ice, we took straight to the lab. The cytopathologist took it from our hands to look at it. The good, quick sample that was well carried had lots of cells. They were very obvious. The sample that we sloshed around and let sit around overnight, there was nothing in it. Same patient, same samples. Um, so sample handling is really key, and people often approach it far too casually. Um, in CSF, uh, the other thing that's really, really helpful is if you have a high suspicion and your initial MRI is negative, you really could consider doing triple dose contrast and making sure, talking to your radiologists about making sure you're getting good, thin sliced, high resolution MRI, because often you're looking for really teeny tiny lesions, and if they're in between the slices, uh, or if the contrast dosing and timing is insufficient, you really might miss something. So good quality radiology makes a huge difference. That's probably a big reason we're having higher 
diagnosis rate because we're getting better quality MRIs these days in general. Um, people often don't proceed to it, but leptomeningeal biopsy is, is, is incredibly helpful. It's, to me, it really is the gold standard. Um, and I think I often talk to our surgeons when they're going in to take out and resect a lesion that's kind of suspicious. I always like to ask them, what did the meninges look like? And sometimes they say, as soon as they open, it was quite obvious that what we saw in MRI was a solitary met, was not at all a solitary met, and it was a cult on the MRI. So I think having these conversations with your radiologists, your cytopathologists, and your neurosurgeons can really, really be helpful, far more than just looking at one person's report. Um, if, the, if the patient has a cancer with a known or highly suspected mutation, you can also talk to your cytopathologist about staining for it. You know, when they see atypical cells, it's really hard to be definitive. It's like looking at, you know, your windshield after a drive on a sunny day. There's just bugs that are smeared. Cytopathology is difficult. It's not straightforward. But if you know that there's a target mutation that's definitive and they stain those atypical cells and they find it, it can be really helpful and confirmatory when you're trying to make the diagnosis. Flow cytometry, I think we all accept as standard these days, but in hemolignancies, it's hugely, hugely helpful. And in fact, I think in some ways we're getting a little too sensitive with flow cytometry for the blood cancer because we'll get these results back that say, oh, we find 1% of this tiny number of cells and we kind of struggle. Is that real or is that just a little bit of blood contamination? So some of these tests, we might move into an era where they're getting a little too sensitive um, and we wonder if we're diagnosing what is true clinical disease or not. Other diagnostic advances that are really interesting and hopefully will help us out in the near future, um, the EpiCam, epithelial cell adhesion molecule, has been in development for at least the last 10 years, but we're finally getting some, some better, more rigorous publications of its use. Um, it is FDA approved in, uh, in the use of systemic blood to track, uh, to track systemic cancer cells, but it has been studied in CSF. It's only really useful for solid tumors of epithelial origin. Those cells should not ever be present in the CSF. So so again, if you find them using CSF samples to look at EpiCam expression on these atypical cells, um, it is more sensitive and specific, and that's been repeated in three or four studies now than standard cytology to make diagnosis, but only for those subsets of cancers. Um, Cell-free DNA or CSF or liquid biopsy uh, is another thing that has now been fairly well studied but isn't widely clinically used. Um, there was a really nice review again from Dr. Bohr on this topic recently. Um, especially if you know you're looking for a target mutation, you really only need to find a couple cells to really confirm your diagnosis. Uh, so HER2, EGFR, BRAF, ALKRAS, and several other uh, cancer-specific mutations can be found in small numbers of cells with these. Uh, with these techniques. I think the other things that I put in question marks there is whether we can use this to diagnose some difficult to biopsy brain tumors with particular mutations. Uh, I have started to have a couple patients with H3 mutations that are detected by blood or CSF. Um, it's a relatively simple test to send, and those are often hard to biopsy lesions. Melanoma proteins have also been studied in a couple of small studies in the CSF. They're very specific, so if you find them, you can be quite confident that there is cancer somewhere in that, that space. Uh, but again, some of these techniques are so sensitive that I wonder if we'll need to move at some point to say, do we have false positives uh, because we're picking up you know, smaller disease than is actually clinically relevant. Uh, but for now, it can be a big help to confirm the diagnosis. Quite often, we're making this diagnosis based on clinical suspicion alone. Uh, some people really will need some kind of MRI report or CSF report or cytology to really make them confident. But I think a lot of times clinically we're quite suspicious and we have an MRI or CSF that is suggestive enough that we accept the diagnosis. It's a big obstacle for trials though. If you're going to organize a good trial, you really do need a definitive gold standard that everyone can agree on. Um, so at as we hopefully move into an era where we do specific trials for this disease, we really do need to have better, more reliable diagnostic techniques, which we're hopefully moving towards. Um, I'll skim rather quickly, I think, through the treatment protocols with a couple of focuses. Um, but uh, Dr. Kayseri and I wrote a, a review article a couple of years ago that, that wonderfully is already outdated because there have been some recent advances since then. So I love to be outdated that quickly uh, because things are changing. But for certain diseases, I think a lot of us recognize you do have very attractive uh, therapeutic options. So in HER2-positive breasts, there are several options and trials going on. Uh, Lapatinib, Keo, with or without capecitabine, can really produce some very nice clinical responses, significant enough to improve patient symptoms. 
some of those responses can be quite durable. These are safe agents. They're not the loveliest for people to tolerate on a daily basis at many times, so they require a lot of symptom management. Intrathecal trastuzumab uh, can be quite effective, uh, has about a two-thirds response rate and can be sustained. Uh, trastuzumab TDM1 that's attached to a toxin, uh, actually even though it's a large molecule, it has a surprisingly high response rate. It shouldn't be able to cross the blood CSF barrier, but in these patients we know that their blood CSF barrier is not normal, so it may be allowing some of these larger molecules in than we, than we realize. And there have been case reports and some ongoing studies of, of third and fourth generations HER2 inhibitors. There's a trial going on uh, for HER2-directed CAR T-cells at several institutions, including Seattle children's uh, for, for younger people with these diseases. Hormone positive breast cancer, this is something that I kind of take for granted that seems to surprise my colleagues. Um, hormone therapies definitely get into the CSF and they can be extremely effective for both brain and leptomeningeal metastases and sometimes quite durable. I think that the challenge I face is often my patients are later on this disease course, so they have failed their systemic treatment of the hormone therapy. Uh, and it's something where you really need to think about the different compartments and I'll have a slide later about how often there's discordance between those. But even in patients who have failed hormonal therapies in the past systemically, their leptomeningeal disease or their brain metastases can be quite responsive to hormone therapy alone, and some of those responses are extremely durable. Um, so not everything has to be brand spanking new and exciting. Sometimes old-fashioned things still work. For triple negative breast cancer, that's really the story is using the older drugs that have some efficacy, um, but using some of the standard CNS penetrant agents that have been studied for decades now, like cubcitabine, uh, the cisplatins with or without other agents. Thiotipa 2 is something that it's been around for years. It's fairly well tolerated, uh, and you can see significant response rates and good control. Uh, and then it's a bit of a regional thing, and it seems old fashioned, but there was definitely a time period where high dose IV methotrexate <clears throat> was a common treatment for brain metastases from breast cancer of all types, uh, and you can truly see some very durable responses. It's an inconvenient drug, but when it's given carefully, quite safe. So I think I'm excited about the new things, but we don't want to forget about our old tools that can, that can sometimes really give a, a pretty good success in these. As the systemic therapy therapies have moved kind of further and further, sometimes it feels strange to be treating these patients with something so old-fashioned, um, but, but they really do work and they're worth remembering. Uh, there are also trials going on with CDK4-6 inhibitors. Uh, which is an exciting topic to look at for brain and leptomeningeal metastases. And they're hot off the presses just this month. There was a nice publication uh, of early results with uh, a paclitaxel tag to angiopep2, uh, which some people in this room have been involved with as well, um, that actually had an extremely high disease control rate uh, when you combine the responses and the stable disease and median overall survival of eight months in leptomeningeal. So I think there's a lot going on, which was not true five to 10 years ago. So hopefully this trend will continue, and I think especially as people focus in on specific disease subtypes. Uh, EGFR positive lung has been something of a, of a great success story. Uh, these patients have a high incidence of leptomeningeal metastases, and some of the EGFR agents have pretty good CNS penetration. Uh, erlotinib was kind of the first thing, and it's still quite useful. What we learned is that the standard daily doses were just not good enough, but when you really increase the dose to this high, high pulse, it's generally well tolerated. You get good CSF penetration, and you can see some really great responses. Uh, they are not always the best maintained. As the third and fourth generation GFR inhibitors and, and drugs for resistance mutations have come out, osimertinib uh, can also be extremely effective, is generally quite well tolerated, and seems to be durable. And we are getting fifth and sixth generation EGFR inhibitors, and many of them are being specifically designed for CNS and CSF penetration because that's so common in this disease. The other thing that, that I really was happy to see uh, someone do some work on was that patients who fail one of these drugs at some point systemically or in the CNS, and you cycle them onto something different, you can kind of re-challenge them sometimes with a drug that failed. And if it's been a while, it does have a, a significant success rate. So sometimes the thinking really has to be a little different. You know, normally we say, oh, they failed that two years ago, there's no point in trying it again. But there really is a point in trying some of these agents again when you're lacking in other options.
Uh, Alk positive lung cancer, although, although fairly rare, has been also uh, seen some nice success. It has a high incidence of leptomeningeal spread in brain mets. Uh, and we now have four different drugs approved, all of which can have a significant CNS response rate, and some of them quite durable going into many months or even several years of good disease control. And the drugs are generally pretty well tolerated. Uh, but electinib and, and crizotinib were the first two, and I've used many times now. Wild type lung cancer is kind of the same story as going back to old fashioned things, but you can see really good responses with platins with or without pemetrexid. You can push the dose in patients who are young and have tolerated it well, especially with pemetrexid, and see significant response rates. Um, and with pembrolizumab and the checkpoint immunotherapies, they have not been that successful in primary brain tumors and gliomas, uh, but in melanoma as well as several kinds of lung cancer and other kinds of solid tumor metastases, uh, from those systemic therapies, uh, you can really see a significant response rate in the brain. Um, and there's some interesting work going on about how the immune responses to checkpoint inhibitors in brain meds can be different than in the systemic disease for both tumor and immune uh, privilege reasons. BRAF mutant melanoma is another kind of hot topic and interesting story. Uh, these patients definitely have a high rate of CNS and leptomeningeal spread. They can be extremely symptomatic and ill, uh, but dibrafenib and bevirafenib, with or without their, their concomitant mech and mech inhibitors, uh, can have a significant response rate in the brain, some of which are fairly sustained. The wild type melanoma is kind of the other big story in which the, the melanoma community has really done a good job of organizing multi-center formal trials specifically for brain meds and looking specifically at leptomeningeal metastases. Um, so we just had a publication last year that was really, really well done, organizing a large trial in this difficult disease and showed that uh, nivolumab with or without ibulimumab has a significant and sustained response rate in brain and leptomeningeal metastases specifically in that trial. We're looked at. The combination arm had a very, very high adverse event rate, uh, but a slightly higher response rate. So I think that's now what we struggle with is, you know, do we go for it and give a high adverse event rate for the higher response, or do you start with a single agent and then maybe consider adding ebulimumab at a later time point? The other thing I want to go over in the last couple of minutes is that prognosis with this disease is really significantly changing. You know, the old-fashioned model 10, 15 years ago was lepto and gel metastases. There was nothing we could do. Most patients we thought only had one to three months. But in certain subtypes of disease, especially breast and a couple others, there's been some nice publications, and I give the references here, showing that you can really be much more detailed and nuanced for a specific disease. So in breast cancer, people who have a, a decent performance status but are some um, and people who are on systemic therapy have a significantly higher survival rate. Um, HER2 positive patients who used to do quite poorly now tend to do quite better as long as they're on some kind of HER2 directed therapy. Uh, and so what I, what I show there is that the patients who are untreated or have none of the favorable risk factors do have that kind of old fashioned prognosis. But patients with at least two or all of the good risk factors, median overall survival can be six to 12 months. And then you kind of look at this tail of the curve that some of these people go two or three years and are still doing, are still alive and stable. And I think we're all seeing that in our practices. Um, so I think it's just something we didn't think was possible before, but now we can actually get better about predicting it and helping make it happen by combining our modalities. The other thing that we have good data on because it's quite common is non-small cell lung cancer. Um, and what we, again, kind of confirming the trend is that if you have a pretty good performance status starting off at diagnosis, if you have one of the actionable treatable mutations, and especially if you have minimal or no systemic disease, median overall survival for leptomeningeal mets from non-small lung cancer in this study was 16 months. I mean, that's not what we ever think of with this disease, but that was median overall survival, and this is real-world clinical data. Uh, so I think prognosis is changing. I think it interplays with conversations with our medical oncology colleagues and our surgeons because often patients need an intervention and they say, well, what's their prognosis? And I think it's in some cases drastically different than what people would have assumed from the past. So for treatment, I just want to kind of briefly summarize, don't assume concordance between systemic disease and the CNS, CSF mutation or resistance status. It's quite common that they're very different. So people with EGFR who are resistant in their, uh, their systemic disease, getting a new sample from the CSF or CNS is very useful because often it is not resistant. So drugs that don't work in the body can still work in the brain. That's been proven across all the different subtypes of disease now, um, and it's quite common. 
15 to 25 percent of patients with the targetable mutations, they will be different in the CNS than they are systemically. Um, so it's important to remember that and kind of spread that to our, our medical oncology colleagues. Uh, and then kind of the thorniest topic is, is this question that I feel I always struggle with of to Omaya or not to Omaya, uh, my patients. I hope it moves towards becoming a moot point at some point in the future uh, as we have more systemic options that are, that are known to be efficacious. But for the patients who need some kind of intrathecal or intraventricular therapy, um, every center is kind of different. But we really don't have any satisfying data to say, should we be giving these people lumbar punctures and true intrathecal injection, uh, which is the most common approach in, in a lot of centers, or should everyone get an OMIA? Should we be giving these drugs when we want to do intrathecal therapy straight into the CSF? Uh, and you have to really go back literally to the 70s when OMIA first started to look for any kind of data to guide you. Um, and arguments for OMIA are that you know, some of the nuclear imaging studies do suggest that you get better CSF circulation when you uh, inject directly into the ventricle. Um, in some ways, it's much easier. The patient comes to clinic, it's a little alcohol wipe, a tiny little needle, and it's very easy. It's very comfortable, usually. Um, Dr. Shapiro showed years ago that you do get higher CSF ventricular concentration. That was very, very well done work um, that when you do it that way versus intrathecal, um, you may get more reliable samples. So if you really want to follow cytology, you can get better yield from samples straight from the ventricle than you do from intrathecal for most patients. And there were two retrospective studies in ALL in children, which is a very different disease. Uh, but both of those studies did suggest a higher response rate when you gave intraventricular versus intrathecal. But for the counter argument, you know, OMIAs do have a small but very significant serious complication rate, so that's always what I worry about. Uh, I do have some patients that are really distressed by the cosmetic factor, um, but it is something that's visible to the patient and to others. Um, and then no one ever really talks about the cost. Um, so we have no studies that really confirm in a clinical setting that you get a higher success rate except for children with ALL. Um, is it worth kind of the slight risk and the cost and the neurosurgery? So I kind of discuss this with my patients and kind of allow the patients to choose. Um, but I know other centers really approach it as, no, no, everyone's going to get an OMIA or no, everyone you know, is going to get a lumbar puncture. But I think it's, it's kind of silly that this is still a kind of an unresolved question that we struggle with. So in conclusion, uh, prognosis of lipid metastases for some diseases is clearly improving. We may have an opportunity at better prevention by risk stratifying people and choosing agents to prevent spread and doing things like neoadjuvant SRS before brain met resection. So we may actually be able to reduce the incidence of this disease, which would be great. There are some tools coming out and moving forward that may make diagnosis more specific, which would really help do more definitive trials across multiple centers. And you really want to think about adopting your treatment approach to, sub, uh, to the subtype of the disease and at particular time points over that patient's course. Um, and I really think it's important to always verify any discordance in systemic disease versus the CSF disease when you're using these molecular targeted agents because it can be surprisingly different. Okay, thank you. Hey. Um, great talk. Um, first, I was fascinated by the compliment thing, which is really interesting. I looked it up sort of while you were speaking, and I saw that increased complement C3A is also associated with the MS. So anything, you know, anything that could be like allowing immune cells and growth factors to go into the CNS is probably not great. Yeah, yeah. If so, they can find a treatment to prevent that, that might be helpful. Yeah, and, and you know, so there was a huge thing in the MS literature back in the 80s about the exact same topic, um, that people with MS maybe have different complement receptor expression on their choroid plexus, as well as different, uh, believe it or not, thyroid hormone receptors in the choroid plexus. There was a huge body of work on this um, that that there may be kind of a, a host-specific factor that could make them more susceptible to neuroimmune disorders. But I think then it raises the question, do some people have an inherently more open choroid plexus or blood brain barrier that makes them susceptible? Uh, Masage and, and Dr. Ward didn't really look at that. Uh, but I think it'd be a really interesting direction to go in. My second question is, having put in a lot of Omayas over the years for sort of last-ditch Hail Mary approaches, in your mind, are there cases that stand out where it was really extremely efficacious and it 
really eradicate the disease. And there's one guy, I think, and if I recall, we were putting Herceptin in it, or maybe I'm confused, but, you know, because the concept is Herceptin doesn't really cross the blood-brain barrier. Yeah, there are definitely people who massively benefit from the Omayas. Um, there are people who respond tremendously and people who you can cycle through multiple options over literally years. Um, the complication rate is extremely low. I tend to remember the times the Omaya caused a problem or got infected, but it really is quite rare. Um, but there are definitely people who benefit hugely from the Omayas. And then, you know, some people, the lumbar puncture is just really difficult. There's people where you just, a little lidocaine and you tap them and it's easy, no problem. And there are other people where it's just torture every single time. So I think that's really, to me, the biggest factor. Uh, and usually you know that after the first LP. Um, so sometimes you start with one approach and you later say, okay, that's not going to work out. I think it's hard, though, to put one in when you, you don't know it's going to work. So sometimes you go through the whole Omaya and then your treatments aren't working and it feels like it was a waste. But I think you know, it, it's important to consider that, too.